This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to hide.me slash epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Tour de Maester. And Tour is actually somebody who was on this podcast before. He didn't remember. Uh, I also had to check whether it was the case, but it is indeed the case. He was in one of the first episodes that we did in February 2014. When we were at, actually, this was also when Sebastian and I met for the first time at uh, Bitcoin, inside Bitcoin's conference in Berlin. Tour was there as well. We did like a bunch of different interviews, uh, shorter, like five, 10 minute interviews. And then one of them was with him. So he's been around for a very long time in the Bitcoin space. He's an economist and an investor. And he's the editor in chief at a company called Admin Research. And among other things, he's been. Oh, he was the first or one of the first people to recommend uh, Bitcoin as an investment to a more kind of mainstream audience, I guess. So, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to have you on tour. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so, well, I guess let's, let's get started with that. How did you originally learn about Bitcoin and how did that journey start for you? Yeah, like overall, it was... In 2006, six, seven, and then obviously eight, I started feeling uneasy about about the economy, and that's kind of why I like worked harder to 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 try and do something online and try and also do something with investing, because because I knew things were gonna shift, and I kind of wanted to know long term what to do in, in in that area, even if I was gonna work in another area, um, and so that grew into a professional activity, and um, <clears throat> so I had been. The, the main thing that I was looking for, uh, seeing that there's so much debt all around the world, uh, corporate debt, but especially sovereign debt, governments and uh, and, and states and, and so on, uh, I was looking for assets that have low counterparty risk. And so I was looking hard into, into gold and silver and those kind of things. Um, but then when I was uh, doing a trip in Argentina, uh, which was in a way also it was also research. I was trying to see if you know I I would want to live in Latin America at some point, which I eventually did. Um, and so I was traveling around there, and I met some people, and they were super excited. This was I think April April two thousand eleven, probably April April May June. Um, very excited about Bitcoin, and uh, and they explained to me how it was useful to them, and how also how it was accessible to them. I mean, this was one of the countries, one of the harshest uh, capital controls and still these people could you know internationally uh, tr trade using bitcoin so that's where it caught my attention and where i started researching it so back then people were actually using bitcoin in argentina like in, in what way were they using it well so these guys had bought some um some graphic cards and mined bitcoins like found a way to mine bitcoin and so early on there wasn't a lot in terms of what you could um, you know, what you could buy, you can buy some alpaca socks back in the day and maybe a pizza, but uh, not a lot at all. Uh, but at the time, even then, it was used sometimes for remittance. I have heard like stories of uh, even like real estate transactions and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there was some use there. Uh, and also as a tourist, uh, because if you wanted to buy the local currency and you went to a bank, you would pay the official, uh, the official rate, which was uh, vastly overpriced. You would buy the pesos at vastly higher prices than if you had either dollar cash on you and exchange in the street, or you had a buddy or on local bitcoins you found someone who would uh, sell you some bitcoin, and then you got the the market rate. So back when uh, back when this was going on, uh, this was in in what year you mentioned? So that's two thousand eleven. Okay, um, so th did you get the, this feeling then that uh, so the Argentinians were looking at this as some sort of you know, refuge store of value? Was there, uh, what, what was the sentiment there uh, re with regards to sort of the you know, Argentinian central bank and Argentinian financial system? Well, I went to one of the first 
Argent uh, meetups in Argentina, um, and there were like five people. <laughs> it was like a barbecue, just five people. Uh, but then later, when I came back, I think it was like a year later, I came back, and they had a they had almost a hundred people at their meetup, um, and so there was definitely interest. Uh, the interest was like in mining. Uh, people were just trying to find ways to you know um, make some money and then they were like also traders people who come in who would like buy and sell or or who would provide to the local market um, so there's definitely and and so and and you the first la Bitcoin the first Latin American Bitcoin conference was in Argentina so there's definitely and and I mean Sergio Lerner is one of the people that was involved in Bitcoin uh, on the core protocol uh, from very early on so they have you know, they definitely have entrepreneurial chops, um, definitely compared to the other Latin American countries. I think uh, they've, 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 been, they've been at the forefront. Uh, still, I don't think that, you know, it was, it was seen as the ideal case for Argentina, uh, but the penetration of technology isn't that deep outside of Buenos Aires. So I think that's kind of why, the, the, you know, that mainstream adoption that people had thought Argentina was going to be the first at, uh, didn't really happen. Uh, maybe not yet. Um, uh, I don't think you know. I think if you look at who is at the forefront right now, it's maybe like countries like uh, Netherlands and, uh, and 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 Israel, where you have like very high level uh, and a very long tradition of, of of technology innovation and adoption by the general public. So Brian mentioned earlier that we met back in 2014. This was a couple of years later, but. I remember being at that Berlin conference and definitely uh, unbanked markets, remittances, this sort of use case was definitely one of the things that a lot of people were talking about at that time. Uh, and uh, even like back then there was projects like 37 coins and, and others like it that were really focused on this sort of, uh, you, know, you know, bridging this you know technological gap uh, that you mentioned by allowing people to say, send Bitcoins through SMS, that kind of thing. So it, it, back then, yeah, I, I agree that there is a lot of uh, a, a lot of use cases centered around sort of bringing uh, financial technology to countries that largely didn't have stable financial systems or financial infrastructure. Right, right, and I mean to some extent, I'm not as fast as people hoped had hoped, but to some extent, that is becoming a reality. Like Bitcoin, definitely is kind of part of the the global remittance rails, even though it's like still a very, very small percentage. Uh, but, you know, when I talk to people who are involved in like, uh, you know, Bitcoin, BTMs um, and stuff, they, they are seeing volumes pick up and it is actually being used for, uh, for remittance. So how did you go from saying, okay, this is cool, this is fascinating, this is a great, a great little thing going on here. How did you go from there to saying, this is a good uh, investment and develop a kind of a thesis around that. And then you also went on to, to advocate that to, to other people. What was the kind of the process that happened there? Yeah, that was hard because, I mean, Macro Trends was my first investment newsletter. And so there I was, I was like, we launched in June 2011. So I was like, Bitcoin is awesome. But like, you know, I don't even know really who my audience is. Because I was uh, partnering up with a with a publisher, so he had this huge email list, and I was basically talking to, I think mainly baby boomers. There were some younger people too, but um, so that's part of why I held off a bit, and also the price at the time was still coming down from the the 2011 bubble. It had like gone up to thirty dollars, and then it went all the way down to two dollars. So that was kind of still happening. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty scary, but the the thing that convinced me was. The technology made sense to me. Like I could see how it 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 just um, you know the the concerns that that people could have. There were arguments against that. Everything every question I had was answered. Uh, and then on top of that, everybody said it was crazy. Like everybody said it's a Ponzi scheme. It can't work. Uh, and so the fact that people that weren't even willing to look at it um, kind of made me think that at least the risk reward maybe this is long term may, maybe it will there's going to be some bugs or problems but at least right now the risk reward seems very favorable because like literally everyone says it's crazy and it's not an investment even the core devs were like imploring me like my current at the time and and also uh peter Vela, like hey like this is an experiment like don't you know don't invest uh or at least be very careful 
So that was like, oh, well, maybe there's something here. And I was always like, you know, I always stress that you, you know, you only want to invest a little bit. Um, but yeah, it worked out. And over time, my confidence just only increased. And uh, the main, I, I am a cryptocurrency maximalist. So the main thing that I was always looking out for is that, is there, you know, is there another asset that could be a better digital gold than Bitcoin? Because that's kind of my benchmark. Like Bitcoin is the digital gold. And, uh, you know, that's why I'm looking out for if there's anything else that's better. And then I might have to revise my thesis that, you know, Bitcoin is the number one digital gold. So you had this email, uh, this newsletter sending macro trends. Uh, how, how did you, how many people were reading that? And what was the kind of feedback you got when you were recommending uh, Bitcoin both back then and maybe later over time? Did a lot of people follow your advice? Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. So uh, from from launch, uh, we had about 400 paying subscribers, and then we grew to about 1,500. Uh, this was in 2013, and then in November 2000. No, actually earlier, summer 2013, I, I kind of started abandoning the newsletter, and, and I found a successor, and so it was all in all like a pretty brief period. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, how the reception was. Uh, People would email me saying like, yeah, this is nuts, like this is a Ponzi scheme. Some other people would ask me specific questions, so I would have a section in the newsletter answering specific questions. I wrote a lot about Bitcoin. I remember uh, kind of looking back in my newsletter, and I think I wrote like uh, 8,000 words before it hit $1,000, just on like, you know, what was happening and some analysis and email updates. Um, so, so I also had an interview with P Peter Werle back in 2012. Um, and so I just tried to address all these concerns, but in the end I did do a survey, which I think I sent out when Bitcoin was like $400 when it was kind of going up in that steep slope in late 2013. And I asked like how many of you have actually bought Bitcoin? And I think, uh, it was about 20%. No, actually this is, uh, this, I already answered this question when, uh, at, um, San Jose. So this must've been before May, 2013. So about only 20% you know, or I actually bought Bitcoin, but I did get stories from people that were like pretty impressive. Like, yeah, they, you know, did very well financially. Uh, the people who, who did buy even a little bit. Uh, and so I feel, I feel really good about that. I just, you know, did what I could. And, um, that's kind of the thing with being early. Like, even if you have a newsletter and even if people do pay for your advice, it's still up to them. Like I, I made some calls that were bad as well. And so maybe they, they, uh, I, 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 I like that people just make up their own judgments. So how has your uh, investment thesis evolved over time? Do you still see it as this digital gold? And, and, and even if you see it as this digital gold, how would you value that? Like, how would you say it's underpriced or overpriced? Like, what's the basis for that? Yeah, that's a good question. So my thesis is actually, I don't think it has changed at all. Uh, like I'm still, you know, I'm still seeing uh, just everything in the economy being way over levered over it. Like banks have leverage that is just way too high. Um, if everybody gets a bailout, then we have hyperinflation. If there are no more bailouts, then we have a bail in, which is, you know, like a, all the banks have to close because there's not enough money around. Uh, and so we need these assets that have very low counterparty risk and that are liquid that you can buy and sell everywhere around the world. So uh, there's a huge, you know, a huge need for an asset that people can use to save in for the long term, not to speculate, not to like do anything like that, but just just money, basically. And um, so, yeah, my thesis is actually, I think, the same, um, maybe just a bit more refined here and there. So how you would value it? Because, I mean, a, a thesis is okay, but then, for example, digital gold, there's also the physical gold. So right. when would, for example, one be overpriced relative to the other? Uh, yeah, that is very, very hard. And I definitely don't have, like, hard metrics. Um, um, I, I do, like, right now, for example, Bitcoin is worth uh zero point zero two percent of all the physical gold and, and above ground that has been mined. So I think it's not crazy to say that that could go to one percent. Uh, especially because Bitcoin has many of the qualities of physical gold and more, right? It has multi sig, you can um store it in, in, in very sophisticated ways that are not possible with physical gold. 
You can verify that it's real in, in better ways sometimes than physical gold because that, that's an issue too. You I have known people that have bought fake coins because uh, tungsten, for example, um, which in, in Europe it's known as Wolfram, it's the, the metal that's inside light bulbs. Um, that has very similar weight, um, it's a very similar weight to volume ratio than gold. So you can just mix it in and, and, and fake gold bars. So, so there's these, these things that you can do with Bitcoin that are really hard to do with physical gold. So in some ways you can say it's the upgraded version of gold. And then there's some, some downside risks that gold doesn't have, which is, you know, the, the, if there's a 51% attack, you cannot 51% attack physical gold. Uh, unless maybe you come up with a way to synthesize it in a lab and, and just produce it out of thin air or something. Um, so so they complement each other very well. And I think, you know, to say that they can, Bitcoin can have 1% and physical gold the rest is not a stretch. And then from there, we'll see. Because if, if Bitcoin is 1%, that means the price is, I think, about $3,000. Well, I guess it would have to go up 50 fold if you said it was at 0 0.02 at the moment, right? So right. if we if we have 500 times 50, that would actually be 25,000, I think. I remember calculating that 1% of the physical gold is is, um, is about $3,000. Okay, but I, yeah. I, I, I could be wrong. I think the total of all the gold in the world, and of course these prices fluctuate, is about, uh, I think it's about $5 trillion. Okay, yeah. There's about 5 billion pounds around. Uh, sorry, five, 5 billion ounces around. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now, in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to the other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J A X X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. So you, you mentioned that you think that Bitcoin is a good vehicle for people to use as a, as a store of values, essentially uh, as a way to save money over the long term. So people buy Bitcoin, they, and it's uh, a good alternative to financial markets and um, fiat currencies that may or may not be around for a long time or uh, may crash at some point. So it, it's a refuge value, uh, if I understand correctly what you're saying. So. Um, Having said that, though, if, if people use Bitcoin as a store of value and people essentially just hold Bitcoin and don't spend it, um, isn't that a counter to this idea that in Bitcoin could be a good investment? Because if people are simply holding it and they're not spending their Bitcoins and not creating sort of economic value around that currency, uh, how, would the, how will the price go up? How, how will Bitcoin become more valuable? I think this is a fallacy that Bitcoin needs to be spent in order for uh, us to together increase the value of, of the network. At least, uh, I don't think Bitcoin has to be spent more or a lot or what. I mean, obviously, at some point, you you know, you would expect it to change hands. But when you look at, you know, the, the, the function of saving in an economy, it's to what you do is you defer gratification and you build up this, you know, this pot of value, and it, it, it grows. And then what you can do is you use it to invest in a company, for example, or a piece, a piece of machinery that will then make something that already has to be done in the economy more efficient. For example, you invest capital in inventing a new type of car. Maybe you know, like what what Elon Musk did with Tesla. That took a lot of saving before that was possible to make that leap. And now. The product is there, and uh, it makes you know it it, it reduces um, 
um, deaths on the road. It um, it it's it's um, more clean, so there's less problems with lung disease maybe over the over the long run. Uh, so there's all kinds of advantages, but that was only possible because of saving. And so I see a similar thing in Bitcoin, where uh, if you save in Bitcoin, um, it, it 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 really rewards long term. Um, long-term improvements to the economy because yes yeah, at some point you will exchange it for maybe something that will yield dividends you you maybe you know buy a house or invest in a company who will then kind of return some of the profits over time but at least with with bitcoin or gold you don't have um this um reality chasing you that it's decreasing in value all the time your, your value is not rotting away like with fiat money like back in the 19th century most people just save in gold. Like that was a huge part of the economy was just savings in gold. And you weren't forced to buy debt or you, like government bonds or other bonds. You weren't forced to invest in the stock market. Uh, part of the reason why we have all these bubbles is because there is not really a, a decent um, f um, uh, medium to save money and for the long run without necessarily wanting to speculate. Uh, so I think there's a huge function and it increases prosperity a huge amount over time and the more people come in they kind of lift them into Bitcoin they lift the boat for everyone uh, there is more value going around there's a bigger all-over market cap uh, there's more liquidity as a result um, so I see all kinds of benefits uh, and so like this word of like you know the, the derogatory word is often hoarding is like you know you just hold on to your coins and you sit on it first of all it's not easy <laughs> it's not easy at all to hold just hold some Bitcoin and not ever sell them or that is very hard but and so, but what you do by doing that is you you help build a floor under the price. So it does it's not going to drop below a certain price because you have all these kind of uh, you know uh, I forget the word, but you have all these hoarders basically that kind of like support the the ecosystem in that sense. And I don't think it's the only function we need. Absolutely, we need developers, we need entrepreneurs, but I think it's a vital part of uh, of the Bitcoin community to have people who decide to save in Bitcoin. Yeah, I very much agree with that. I think the, the argument around the digital gold is actually pretty strong with Bitcoin. And you don't need that much besides a secure network uh, and, and then the ability to trade it for fiat currency, you know, easily kind of all over the world, right? If you have that, that's actually already enough to to be good as, as a store of value. And then you, you don't necessarily need even the you know, opportunity to spend Bitcoins and buy your coffee with it. I think that's, that's sort of, it enhances, of course, the usefulness of Bitcoin, but it's not absolutely required. That's kind of bonus, those things like microtransactions and then especially like the second layer stuff where, uh, you know, you have the Lightning Network and high-speed transactions. If you look at physical gold, um, uh, I'm totally not saying that this system is, 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 anywhere close to perfect um, but just as like you know it kind of works uh, physical gold and what you see is that there are wholesale markets in gold and uh, so if you want to actually move a ton of gold you need to go there uh, usually especially if you are going to do it on a regular basis and stuff so in London there's the London Bullion Market Association they only have I think about seven members or something and they move the most gold in the world and when you look at the transaction volumes they're like tiny I don't remember the exact number I remember looking it up I think it was like a hundred transactions a day or something but every transaction is on average seven million dollars worth of gold um, and so uh, you know and, and there's layers built on top of that people buy the financial products that are emitted by the members of the London Bullion Market Association or gold miners sell their gold uh, to that organization and so you can have layers, uh, layers of confidence built on top of that. And the problem with physical gold is that there are hardly any decent audits. So there's a lot of question about like, is all that gold really there? Is it is it not fractional? But you don't have that problem with Bitcoin. You can always um, monitor the the Bitcoin blockchain. I I, I understand your guys' argument. Uh, I would say that gold has somewhat of a different um, is positioned differently in the financial system as it has been a historical value for millennia uh, whereas uh, whereas Bitcoin is relatively new and so Bitcoin's value being 
inherit to the fact that it's only a store of value, uh, that may be true for gold. You may, you may, like, we may be able to say, okay, gold can be a store of value in itself, and even if we're not using it as, uh, you know, as for payments every day. Uh, but I think that in order for that to happen with Bitcoin, um, the store of value aspect of it in itself is not enough for uh, for the price of Bitcoin to be. To, you know, to go to these heights that people have been predicting, you know, uh, two thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, or whatever. So I, I, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think if you had a lot of people who wanted to treat it as a store of value, then the price could go super high. I mean, look at gold. I think the problem with Bitcoin more is the security model completely breaks down over time, at least if pe- people don't. Uh, use it a lot because, well, I, I think the security model of Bitcoin in the long run doesn't work in any case. Uh, but but really, because the mining reward goes down and down, like at some point, it just becomes kind of unsustainable. Right. Because miners, uh, the, the revenue for providing network security goes away. And if people don't That's use it point. a lot, then transaction fees don't make up for that. Yeah, you do. I like. I agree that you do need um, you need uh, liquidity and transactions. Uh, I mean, that feeds into the motivation for people to use Bitcoin as a store of value. Like that. That's kind of. I, I guess I'm like. You can look at it from different uh, perspectives. Um, like part of the reason why you would want to own gold is like if you know uh, there's this story i don't really know if it's true but it's like it circulates among uh you know gold fanatics or whatever gold bugs um that uh, one of the things that was given to british fighter pilots when they were on their mission is some gold coin because uh after they crashed it didn't matter where in the sahara they would still be able to uh you know to 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 buy some some food or transportation and that especially historically wouldn't always be the case when you just had dollar bills because those could be fake um but so, so the fact that people actually accept it and you can do transactions with them and there's evidence of transactions uh, and then also for the miners, it's important that there are transactions uh, because it, in the long run, that's what they need. They need the transaction fees. And so that's probably why these you know, side chains and stuff are going to be helpful in, 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 in kind of securing the long term future of Bitcoin because uh, high volume transactions, they can then... Um, some small fee can be charged on that, and then the miners can also profit of that. So I, I agree that it's it, it's not just exactly one or the other. So since you started uh, recommending Bitcoin, it's a long time. Uh, a lot of time has passed, right? The world is, is, is a different world. Bitcoin has changed a lot. The cryptocurrency, the blockchain community has uh, evolved enormously. So how do you look at the... the community and Bitcoin today? How would you describe the state of Bitcoin? And are there any sort of objective metrics that you follow and have been following over time to kind of say, okay, how how is Bitcoin doing? Well, when you look at the amount of value that is being moved on chain uh, in terms of dollars, right? The dollar denominated value that's being moved moved on the Bitcoin blockchain is the highest ever. I don't know exactly how much it is. I think it's about fifty billion dollars a year or something. Um, so from that point of view, Bitcoin is extremely healthy. Uh, when you look at Bitcoin from a security point of view, there are no major concerns. Like all the, you know, all the 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 uh, there is a hard fork um, kind of. Uh, um, proposal that is in the works, but that's more to kind of fulfill the promises. I think Peter Todd is working on that. No, actually Luke Jr., I think. Um, but there's a very small chance that the hard fork is actually going to happen. So security-wise, uh, Bitcoin is extremely healthy, I think. Also, if you look at uh, the hash rate, uh, it's basically on its course to triple again compared to last year, um, which means that the firewall around Bitcoin is just getting stronger and stronger. Um, and so eventually we're going to have these commoditized mining chips. And so that will allow more diversification among the miners. I think uh, the centralization of Bitcoin mining in Bitcoin is, is overblown. I don't think it's, it's a real issue. Uh, 51% attack is kind of still a possibility. But, um, you know, because of the, 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 the increase in hash rate, it's again, it becomes harder and harder. Um, I think it's going to be more tempting for governments to start accepting 
taxes in Bitcoin or accepting some form of payment in Bitcoin, which is like the love-hate relationship that governments, I think, will have with Bitcoin in the future is that, um, you know, I hate it because people can, uh, you know, they, they can get paid internationally, like all kinds of gray black market transactions can happen with this. But then the love is like, oh, well, how about I can tax people, you know, so so I'm, I'm, I want Bitcoins as, as, a, as maybe even as a reserve asset in the long run. Um, so my main focus is always security, and I think Bitcoin by far is the most secure cryptocurrency there is. And uh, even by its own measures, it's that's just improving. And then there's these wonderful uh, technological innovations that are happening with Lightning Network and sidechains. And um, a lot is happening on terms in terms of fungibility too, so improving the privacy of Bitcoin. Uh, a lot of talks about that now on, in the Scaling Bitcoin conference in Milan. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just more positive than, than I've ever felt about Bitcoin. Cool. That's great. I, I really like your perspective because I think certainly on this podcast, we've become more skeptical over time. I think there's a lot of reasons for this. One of them is just how divided the community has become. I think there's, it's been, it's become a very negative, hostile environment. Which, which was completely different in 2013, where there was extremely a lot of uh, uh, optimism, exuberance, activity. So I think that's something that's changed. Um, I, it's certainly true that a lot of innovation is happening. Uh, and, and yeah, you're right. I think at this point, Bitcoin is secure. I, personally, I think there are some design flaws that could lead to problems down the line, but you know, they're not, not on the horizon at this point. Um, but I also think a, a big thing has just been that a lot of activity when it comes to startup activity is it's not happening on Bitcoin, right? That's happening uh, with Ethereum or with permission blockchains. I think those those are the two areas where a lot of activity is. So, but that being said, of course, you know it's it's very exciting, and and a lot of the technological projects that we are seeing they're there, right? With Lightning Network, Security Witness, etc. And we, we just, we haven't really seen the effects of that. So it's, right. it's nice to have somebody who has the, the full on, um, <laughs> <laughs> a, a different perspective and, and sees more ways, more the positive sides than the, the things that aren't going so well. Yeah. I, I mean, when you talk about the startups, um, yeah, it's definitely true. Although like, but even back in 2012, 13, there were a lot of like, um, startups who, I guess back in the, back then transaction fees were not an issue so you could build uh you know um a gambling website and you just do it all on chain like like um uh, satoshi dice or you could have a, a stock market that kind of operated on the bitcoin blockchain but then over time people kind of started seeing that oh there's transaction fees so we can't just you know uh, put all these transactions on the network and then it took you know, sidechains was an idea, but it, it takes it just takes a long time to make that leap. And so people have like um, segued into focusing on altcoins, which already I mean, back in 2013 was already pretty, you know, pretty a lot of activity was there. Uh, and then also, yeah, you're right. Uh, Ethereum, which is also an altcoin. And then, they, they, you know, build, trying to build on top of that because it's more accessible. Um, I think it's true. There's you know, as far as applications go, there is more activity in, in the altcoin space than there is in Bitcoin. Uh, because I think it's because Bitcoin is harder. And uh, and, and my, my contention is that uh, Bitcoin is more robust and it will scale better in the long run because it has these layers and doesn't try to do everything on the main chain. Uh, and I, so I think that this startup activity is going to return to Bitcoin. Um, in part because that's where the most money is and that's where the, you know, the, the network effect is the strongest and because it's the most secure network. If you want to help people store value or move value, then I think the minimum requirement is that you offer the best security possible. I'm not sure I would agree with the idea that the startup activity is going to return to Bitcoin. I don't think Brian, what, what your thoughts are on this, but, um, we, we both work in startups that uh, deal in uh, are in the blockchain space and all of the demand today is coming from enterprise who want to implement blockchain technologies um, and for the most part using permission blockchains as a way to upgrade existing infrastructure that is you know just um, like in a dinosaur era 
right. what do you feel about that yeah i think that's i think that's great and uh, and i think that um, it's possible that that demand is not going to weaken i'm not saying that all the entrepreneurs that are now you know building permission blockchains are going to you know move back to to bitcoin what i think is that um what if bitcoin goes from 10 billion to 100 billion then all of a sudden there's 100 billion dollars worth of savings that wants services i want to send my bitcoin to india and i want that money to be deposited on a bank account somewhere or um i want to you know uh, to do uh, an initial an ipo on a side chain like help me do that like there's all this money now in bitcoin like help us do that um and i don't think that money has to be siphoned away from from you know other blockchain projects uh, i think it's possible but I, I don't really think that needs to happen at all so i don't know if that makes sense like i don't necessarily think that the blockchain space would shrink a lot uh although i do think there's maybe some you know some overzealousness in terms of what you know what private blockchains actually can achieve but um yeah, I think that both can totally coexist. And in a way, I feel like, you know, the private chains, and maybe you're not just talking about private chains, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think permission blockchains is kind of like talking about intranet solutions back, you know, back in the day. It's like, oh, well, let's improve office infrastructure and like kind of improve the way uh, we communicate between these these uh, companies. Uh, and I think that has its place. And um, I, I think they totally can coexist. Today's magic word is investment, I-N-V-E-S-T-M-E-N-T. -E Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. You wrote this really great article uh, back in, in 2014 uh, on Coindesk entitled uh, Why Bitcoin is the Petroleum of Our Time, which uh, at least for one, reminds us how uh, cruelly we treat animals, or have always treated animals. Uh, and uh, so, in, in this article, you um, you you compare uh, uh, Bitcoin to so the uh, the the transition from the whale oil economy to the petroleum oil economy, uh, and and explain that Bitcoin is to the current financial system what petroleum was to the to the whale oil industry uh, back in the 19th century. Uh, and although I, I agree that there are similarities there, I think there's one uh, specific characteristic that is different um, from, from, that, uh, from that transition in those technologies is that the rails on which uh, th that industry uh, was basing itself on, that is uh, the lamp, um, was the same. So, you know, if you had an oil lamp, you could, or any, any type of um, apparatus that burned uh, whale oil uh, as a source of heat or, or energy, uh, you would simply need to put uh, this new type of oil, like uh, uh, kerosene, uh, in this apparatus, and it would work. So the, the underlying infrastructure was the same. Whereas with the financial system, that is not the case. And I think that that is one of the major reasons why we haven't seen this mass adoption of Bitcoin as uh, people were predicting back, you know, two years ago when we first met. Uh, I mean, back then there was so much enthusiasm about, you know, Bitcoin will be like massively adopted next year and two years from now. Uh, the price, you know, people making like outrageous price um, predictions, which we all sort of believe, I guess. But I think that that fundamental difference, the fact that you can't simply go from the existing financial system that is so ingrained in our society and our culture and our politics and every, you know, just the world economy uh, and just say like, okay, now I want to use Bitcoin in that same system. That's a major flaw and I think will be will continue to be a huge burden on, on Bitcoin as something that can be massively adopted by just anyone. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think it's true that... Um... You know, like even well back with petroleum, what did need to happen was you needed to um, distill it in some way. You couldn't just use the crude oil. You had to, you know, make like you say, you have to make the kerosene, and uh, and then maybe also redesign some of the lamps. And but there was like no regulation almost whatsoever. There's a good movie about the early oil era, and so there was some adjustment that needed to happen. But there was virtually no regulation whatsoever. 
and uh, also the whales were already dying. Uh, I mean, in the sense that the population was declining, so the price was, was high. Uh, and then there was all these all these new applications for petroleum that were kind of adding to the appeal. Um, so yeah, I agree that that you know the the adoption there was easier than for Bitcoin, especially. I mean, money is really, it's almost, there's also almost a, like a religious element to it too. Like it's almost like blasphemy to advocate uh, the use of another type of money than the national currency. Because uh, that's what you use to pay your taxes with. And that's what, you know, how you get your subsidies and how you pay your, your workers and all that. So there's that. Then there's the fact that well, with Bitcoin, you, until very recently, or, I mean, uh, until even in so on-chain transactions is only seven per second. So even if the whole world wanted to use it, they would all have to use these clunky Bitcoin exchanges that would then get robbed. And so there's a lot more bottlenecks for Bitcoin to actually scale, uh, which I think was why it's taking a longer time. And then there's also these psychological barriers that uh, are just, I mean, yeah, who cares what your you know oil lamp is made of? But if you have to explain to your aunt or grandmother that your savings are now in Bitcoin, which I don't recommend that all your savings are in Bitcoin, but it's just like, it can be a weird conversation. Uh, you know, maybe it's like, she'll be like, oh, well, you use it to buy drugs? Like, why do you have Bitcoins? Um, so I think there's more controversy there. And like you say, that the rails, there's just, just way more effort is needed to, to develop the infrastructure. Like, I mean, look at how long it took for the internet to take off. It was, you know, it was decades. Uh, the early peer-to-peer -peer protocols were developed, and then I think it took about 20 years for it to go mainstream. To, to come to your question, uh, Sebastian, your point about, uh, you know, startups and, and to Bitcoin and the sort of case for Bitcoin, I think right now the, I don't see any signs of an increased number of startups building on Bitcoin. Uh, if anything, it's decreasing. Mind you, I, I say that, but like the company that I, that I work for and co-founded, we actually do stuff on Bitcoin. Yeah, like we we use Bitcoin like it's in our API, uh, but we're one of the few startups that do that, or at least in the sort of permission blockchain space. Yeah, so, so some do, and and some will continue to do, and uh, but I also think Tour's point is is very valid, right? Because fundamentally, it is. If you look at this technology, if you look at blockchain, blockchains, and then one of the very obvious use cases uh, and uses of it, and I think that is something that will have uh, really a future, is is the idea of, of exactly what Bitcoin's trying to do as a sort of native digital asset that you can use for uh, payments and for a store of value. And if you if you look at that, then what's important for that to succeed? Um, so network effects are very important. Uh, it's important to have a sort of history and the trust behind it. And, and just that Bitcoin has been around for a long time is certainly uh, a longish time. is certainly a, a strong factor there. So if you ask me today, you know, what, what has the best chance of being that kind of asset? Also, a, you know, a, a non-governmental controlled asset. That's not to say that there won't also be government issued cryptocurrencies and all, I think there's a role for that too. But at the same time, there will be a demand for uh, a non-government controlled asset. Uh, and, and then you know, if you ask me, like, what has the best chance of making that? I would still say that's Bitcoin at this point. Um, and, and if that is going to go that way, then there will be opportunity to build various startups around that. So I, I, I totally, I see your thesis, I think it's a, it is, I totally buy that. It's just, I guess we, we don't know how likely it's, it's going to be that it happens, but it's totally plausible and, and not unlikely, I think. And one of the use cases too that we failed to mention here and that we often forget uh, with Bitcoin, and I, I think like on the enterprise side at least, uh, it will con is demanded and will continue to be demanded is the fact that you can you know, have a digital, uh, secure, immutable registry of historical facts, which is notarization. Uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, Bitcoin is the only trusted, public, uh, decentralized network that allows you to have really good notarization um, for really cheap. Uh, and 
until another network comes along and <clears throat> makes it uh, easier, cheaper, and more scalable, uh, which I don't see any real contenders right now, I think Bitcoin will continue to have this uh, as like a really good use case for enterprise to keep using it. And since enterprise will use it, uh, then that gives Bitcoin, I guess, more legitimacy with um, these institutions that perhaps on the monetary side, on the uh, on the Bitcoin as money side, don't support it so much. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's kind of weird how, you know, Bitcoin is this tree. I imagine it like this tree and it has roots that go like into like deep into Mordor with the like the dark net, which, by the way, Darknet markets talk about Bitcoin startups, <laughs> and there's lots of Bitcoin startups there that you know yeah. nobody talks about, uh, which I don't know that much about, but I do know that the volumes are there and there's lots of activity. Um, so, so, so the the roots go really deep, uh, and then you have the trunk, which is may, maybe like Bitcoin as a store of value, and then there's the, the tree with all the like the fruit that comes off, and part of part of that is I think what you're talking about is like. The most trusted timestamp in the world is, you know, a transaction on the Bitcoin network. Uh, there's just there's nothing out there that that beats it for now. And so, long term, what I hope will happen is that the the um, you know permission ledgers will kind of touch base every now and then with the Bitcoin blockchain to just use it as a layer of consensus, like just kind of like, all right, we're this is our hash. We'll dropping it in in uh, in the main chain. Uh, just so you know, and then we do a whole bunch of things off chain, and then we come back. Um, I think I think that could could be very very interesting, and I don't I don't see why not why you would not sometimes touch base with the main chain of Bitcoin. I agree, and I, I think that from what I've seen anyway, uh, increasingly uh, enterprise has become more comfortable with this idea. So they they, they there's an understanding that uh, that you need to have a permissioned system um, for certain use cases and that you know you can anchor down into the Bitcoin blockchain once in a while, as you said, to provide that layer of certification, that layer of uh, independent audit, that, that layer that enables independent auditability of whatever uh, you're dealing with on a higher level in your, in your, uh, in your infrastructure. And so that, I think that that gives it, I've definitely seen a, a sort of a shift in mentality with enterprise, uh, people working in enterprise that, um, uh, on, on Bitcoin and sort of that being a very legitimate use case uh, that you know they can see uh, being used in within their their uh, infrastructure. Yeah, and like and the fact that you know something that a lot of people deplore, but it's still the case. The fact that uh, Bitcoin has never had a hard fork, kind of like it should Im like it should validate that thesis that oh well yeah this is kind of an immutable. Uh, blockchain and so we can trust it with a, a timestamp it won't be you know it won't be changed or reversed and it's proof of work which means that it's incredibly hard it's like basically impossible to change anything past that's happened more than an hour ago let's take a short break and talk about hi.me hi.me is a vpn provider and if you don't know yet why you should need a vpn provider let us help you I'm sure you were like me, and when all the crazy revelations came out during the Snowden time uh, of all the, the spying that is being done by the NSA and other government agencies, you were shocked and you said, not with me, not with my own rights. Now, the way government agencies can spy on you, there's many of them, but the most easiest way is by simply going to your ISP and getting all your traffic, capturing all your traffic. And a VPN can protect you from that. It can give you a secure tunnel from your computer to any of the exit nodes all over the world so that all your traffic goes to this secure pipe that's encrypted and cannot be intruded on. And with Hike.me, you can choose any of their, their 30 exit nodes all over the world so you can enter the internet in a secure location. The best thing about Hide.me is that they have a free plan, which includes two gigabytes of unthrottled bandwidth per month. So you can go to Hide.me slash Epicenter to create your free account. And when you use that URL, you'll automatically get 35% off if ever you decide to go premium. Now the premium plans are really great. They include unlimited bandwidth, access to all of the 30 exit nodes that Hide.me provides, and you can install it on up to five devices at a time. So you can have this running on your phone, your tablet, your computer at work, your personal computer, and just be completely protected all the time. And of course, Hi.me accepts Bitcoin. 
So we'd like to thank Hyde.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Now, speaking about other cryptocurrencies, right? There's a lot of other projects. There's uh, certainly Ethereum that's gotten a lot of attention. There's some that will be launching soon, Zcash, which um, you know we've also talked about on the show. We've had Zuko on, and, and it's certainly a very interesting project. Uh, and then there's a whole lot of others that, you know, some of them are interesting, some of them are not, but a lot of them get attention. So what's, what is your view on, on those projects? Do you view them as uh, interesting investment opportunities as well? How do you evaluate those? And, and how do you compare them with Bitcoin? Yeah, so usually with altcoins, I see them as like interesting kind of trade opportunities in the short to medium term. I haven't found an altcoin that I really would want to stick with for the long run. Uh, like as of now... So I had a like a small long position in in Monero. I sold pretty like when it was like three hundred million dollars market cap. So pretty much at the top. Um, and then Zcash, I do plan to buy some. Um, I have some Litecoin still. Uh, I have a short position in Bitcoin versus Ethereum. So if if Ethereum is stagnating and Bitcoin goes up, then uh, that will be profitable. Um, <clears throat> so so that's kind of my view is that um, I think there there can be uh, like for example with privacy i think uh altcoins can complement bitcoin because for now even though there's a lot of interesting work happening um because uh, like coin join for example is i think a bit expensive because of the transaction fees um so if you have a younger altcoin that is focused on privacy like monero you know there might be some value there um uh, and then there's zcash as well but uh, I think there was, there was, you know, privacy will be implemented in a sidechain probably or in some other way in Bitcoin. There's a lot of a lot of avenues there. Uh, and then as far as smart contracts go, uh, I don't see, you know, I have trouble seeing how um, computing the actual contract on a blockchain is is long term viable and useful. I think you, um, you know, you want to validate contracts on a blockchain but not compute them. So. Um, I, 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 that's why, that's part of why I'm bearish on, on Ethereum. The main reason is I think there's a lot of security issues that are kind of baked into the system because of the design choices they made. Um, so I don't know, that's maybe in a nutshell. I think Zcash is really interesting because, uh, the technology has been around for quite a while. Z, um, zero coin at the time, uh, back in 2013 was a concept. And so they kept, they kind of took the longer term approach, which I appreciate. Uh, I think the main concern there is that, uh, first of all, it's, it's a separate chain. So they have kind of the network effect of Bitcoin to compete against. And then the other one is that um, trans, um, the transactions are bigger. So they require more space on the blockchain. Uh, it used to be, I think, about 50 kilobytes. Now they managed uh, the minimum, I think, is about five kilobytes. Um, which is is great, but the uh, the question is like, are users going to, um, you know, are, are they going to be okay with a, a pretty fast growing blockchain versus the Bitcoin one, for example? Well, with Zcash, and this is what we were discussing earlier before the show, is that, uh, I mean, although there are some use cases, I think for you know for privacy as a public network, uh, I mean, we have a lot of that now. I mean, there's you mentioned CoinJoin. Uh, there are other sort of blockchains that provide privacy, and you know, once you have Bitcoin, I mean, if you want to just like trade that for Litecoin on Shapeshift, and then back into another currency, and then back into Bitcoin, there's it's very hard after some, for someone to trace uh, the flow of those transactions. With with Zcash, increasingly, where I see potential use cases is uh, as a as a permission network, so uh, as a way to trade assets, for instance. Uh, um, so one could imagine uh, some sort of an exchange built on Zcash, where perhaps you need to have KYC on the individual addresses, but you want those transactions to be private. Interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I'll uh, I'll think about it more. And so, uh, what about app coins and the crowd sales? Is is that something you're you're watching as well, and and you find interesting? Well, I mean, that's like the problem. There is that they're fighting this enormous wall of the network effect. Like, why would you buy the coin? Oh, well, it's because it's part of our company, or because it's the asset that you need to like, you know, vote vote here or to uh, gamble or or whatever. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of like a corporate credit, or in you know, or some form of of um, of equity, um, and um, I just 
it's like why not launch on on as a sidechain well it's hard to develop a sidechain it's like, all right well maybe that's saying something about the quality of your team if you can't do that um so yeah like i have not seen things that i'm like really and and i don't think like i'm dogmatically opposed to anything that's not bitcoin like i i i really yeah i, don't, I really don't think so it's just uh i think and also sometimes i'm suspicious that it's just a quick money grab uh these plans are just very very like thin and uh you, you know just a lot of projects have failed and it's kind of sad because a lot of people come into bitcoin or the crypto space and they're new and they see these projects and they can totally see it like oh i can totally imagine this decentralized exchange or you know this project or uh but they don't realize it has been tried in bitcoin before like it in 2012 or 2013 uh so a lot of these half-baked ideas they just come back and try to like entice a new generation so uh, sometimes it makes me mad that it's like well you know you you know it takes a lot of effort to debunk some of these things to really look at the technology and kind of show that hey this is not sustainable long term and so a lot of people don't bother because they have their own lives and their own projects and then you know people get suckered in there's like they don't really know the kind of arguments they're new to the space so um it's kind of the pink sheets right am i against pink sheets which is like a um, platforms uh, for um penny stocks that's what pink sheets are and it has a very low low barrier of entry you can very easily do it um you know, lots of fraud is happening there. I don't. I'm not against the concept. You know, some of these companies do become viable over term, over the long term, which I suspect. You know, the uh, cryptocurrency crowd sales are probably also going to yield some interesting results. Uh, like in a way, Tesla is doing crowd sale as well. It's not like it's you know it's a bad thing, but uh, there's a lot of uh, just nasty stuff that I don't like. Um, and, and looking at individual projects and the thing is that sometimes it's just my suspicion i don't know until it implodes and then you know we can pick up the pieces and we know what happened yeah no i'm, I'm totally in agreement with you i think the, the concept is strong but at the same time it's been just too easy to raise money uh with these crowds also we've seen a lot of very right. bad projects yeah like and... for example rep uh, the, the sorry the, talking about auger uh market cap is 72 million dollars now is that really is that project worth that much like building on top of ethereum which is now under attack and like i'm just saying like it's i'm not saying it's impossible but yeah just on the face of it that seems high <laughs> that seems really high to me yeah i'm 100 percent in agreement with actually i that's auger is something i've looked at quite a lot i thought about and uh, i felt like it doesn't really make sense to me how they built it and and it's interesting because then I was like in the crowd sale. I was like, should I participate in that? And I was like, no, I, I don't think that's going to work. And it's tempting because you know it's probably going to go up in the beginning. Right? right. And now you look at it and now it's gone up insanely. And it's right. not like that any of the concerns I had have been addressed or are valid anymore. Uh, I still think they're valid. We don't know. Maybe maybe they're right. Maybe they're going to solve it all. But it's it's still very fundamentally unproven, but then it's worth an insane amount, which is if you look at what does a startup have to do in order to raise venture capital at those kind of valuations, they have to be at a very, very different point uh, than than some of these projects. So I, I am, you're totally right. It's uh, the, the whole crowd sale thing has gotten a little bit um, irrational. And, and I mean, part of it is that, and I, I know this for a fact, I mean, I've heard that say literally, part of it is that some people feel they missed out on Bitcoin on the big, you know, the big rally and they, um, they want to, um, they want to um, uh, have, draw right the next wave. And I think that's too bad because there is probably going to be a next big rally in Bitcoin. And if they are all like spread out in, in reps and in all these other altcoins, they're, I think they're going to miss out. That's I think that's too bad. I think Bitcoin, as far as investing goes, I think there's a huge amount of value that is not being expressed now in market cap. That, uh, that is, I think is probably going to come closer to it in the next two years. Uh, I think we're going to see a big, big rally. Actually, that's a, that's a good point, bringing us to that. Uh, so you've, you're one of the people who have made predictions about price at various times. Many people in the space don't do that. Um, what's your view right now? Like, What do you see over the next six months and over the next few years? Yeah, like maybe first, like as far as like what I have done in the past, uh, like I've always said that I thought Bitcoin was going to go up. Um, 
and then the the I did become uh, bearish in like January 2014, which is when it was a thousand dollars. I thought it was a double top, and it would go down, and it did go down. Uh, I did make the mistake that I thought that it was going to be a similar period of going down as the two previous times, which it wasn't. It was a lot longer this time. So that I I, I, I misinterpreted. I think mainly how much um, what would happen when the miners would start selling their coins. Uh, and then also I underestimated the amount of fraud that was happening in Mt. Gox and how the markets were actually artificially high. Uh, but I, I mean, uh, after I realized that it was like around Bitcoin being like 500, 400, I did think that we could go down below um, below 300 and, and hit 200 and we did. Uh, and, and I've been bullish since like Bitcoin was $300 again, that it would go up again. So we were double now. So they were already in a rally. It's 600 now. Um, for me, the main thing that I look at is sentiment. Uh, I don't really think like, oh, well, Bitcoin is going to hit 2000 or five, because once it goes up, it's like it, it can go to 2000 or 5000 or even 10,000 in one big rally. Like it's just when things go insane, they go insane. Like you just, it just happens. Like how could you predict how high the NASDAQ was going to go back in, in 99, 2000? Uh, so I do think we will have some type of mania situation. Um, and so then I mainly look at the sentiment and then how, how if you have stories of people saying like, I'm putting all my life savings in, savings in Bitcoin or look, look at my fancy Bitcoin tattoo, uh, you know, that kind of stuff starts coming up, then it's probably time to diversify out of Bitcoin again. Uh, and we're not seeing that now. I think, you know, the sentiment is very like, tepid and not there's not a lot of excitement about bitcoin at this point so you're saying that if i see a guy with a bitcoin tattoo i should sell uh if he, yeah which I, I mean that's what back in late 2013 like i was like i saw this guy who was boasting and he had he had done it the day before so and it was on twitter and i retweeted it saying like we're probably close to the top and that was on bitcoin was like it was like uh literally a week away from the top it was so close so yeah i mean it's it sounds silly but yeah when people start doing things that you wonder like kind of like back in you know talk to people who were there at the at the nasdaq bubble uh you know what happened what 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 were people's mindset like if it sounds like euphoria and uh, uh you know i think that that that's something you want to look out for rather than just look at the price um i mean of course you can diversify on the on the way up you can just gradually sell some or just you know stick with it because i think the price in five years is going to be even higher than what it's going to become uh, during this rally so the I, I always have a hard time taking predictions seriously because I, i've heard so many people make predictions and they all oh, yeah. turned out to be pretty wrong i mean i think i remember at that at that conference where we were at in berlin a few years ago there was one one guy at the end i mean there, there always used to be one guy at the end say so you know on the panel like what, what do you think the price will be and people making just predictions off the top of their heads uh, what, what are your predictions uh, for the next uh, year, uh, five years, ten years, if you have, if you have any? Yeah, I, I don't really. Uh, I just like, I just, it's gonna be higher. It's gonna be higher expressed in dollars. It's gonna be higher expressed in gold. Um, uh, I think that you know these waves are real, so we are gonna see it, you know it move in waves uh, going forward as well. Um, I think like saying like ten thousand dollars by two thousand like 19 or something is like very much not outrageous. Um, um, it, you know, like once is Casada saying eventually a million dollars? Yeah, like it also depends on how low the dollar is going to go. Like what will you, you be able to buy with a million dollars 10 years from now? I don't know. Is it going to be a house, a car, a bike, uh, a pencil? Like, you know, it really depends on what the dollar does. And that's kind of why I'm really like really bullish on bitcoin and on gold is because like deutsche bank for example i in a they were, you probably saw it in my amsterdam presentation i had a slide about deutsche bank saying that it was massively over levered there would be problems and look at the news now like yes indeed deutsche bank is is probably going to be either the biggest bankruptcy or the biggest nationalization in europe and there's going to be a lot of fallout from that um you know, the banking system is rotten and people are going to look for uh, a refuge. And uh, I think that the um, uh, the SDR from the IMF is not a panacea. It's not going to solve anything. Uh, money printing is going to go forward full throttle. Uh, interest rates are not going to be raised significantly because then you just, you just explode the government bond market. 
so all these reasons uh, are, are reasons for me to be bullish on Bitcoin. And I'm not really excited about this stuff because a lot of things will be disrupted and uh, high inflation is very disruptive for economies. Uh, it's it's not really fun to like even if you have a good you know you make a good living the crime rises and all those things uh, but it's probably I mean in the long run it will be for the better uh, because I think we need a more balanced system we need more balance between public and private assets and right now all the money in the world is issued by the governments and they're not responsible so we need some counterbalance yeah I was I wanted to come to that topic maybe briefly before we we end the show so you uh, of course, your thesis, right, is to a significant extent, as you talked about, uh, driven by what we are seeing with uh, just an enormous uh, explosion of debt, and and we, you know, two thousand eight is, is quite a, a long time ago now, uh, eight years ago. Uh, we're certainly seeing some things that aren't uh, doing so well. Deutsche Bank being one example. Do you see? But what's what's your view here on the time horizon? Do you think Deutsche Bank is, um, and and maybe some other things that we're seeing and are going to happen? That's are those outliers? Is this you know one event? We'll see other events over the next year. So is this sort of the beginning of something else like two thousand eight? Do you have any kind of view on that? What are we speaking about? Do you think this could go on another ten years uh, of uh, you know quantitative easing and? Uh, zero interest zero percent interest rates so yeah first of all the nature of the problem like the nature of the problem is is insolvency we have insolvency and uh you know um in that sense the way to look at the financial system from my point of view is kind of the way you would look at an enron or the way you would look at mount gox or the way you would look at bernie madoff's empire before it collapsed you just you're an insider and you can look at the books and you see that it doesn't make sense and that, um, you know, probably this is going to, you know, hit the wall at some point. But you don't really know what is going to be the thing that will cause Enron to blow up. You don't know. Um, there could be many things. It's it's all like what is going to... And, and the question for the economy at large is, when are people going to realize that um, they are losing money if it's sitting in the bank? If uh, their their savings account, even though it gives them... 2% interest rate per year, the inflation is higher, so they're losing money. And what is it going to take for people to realize that they're going to lose money faster every year? Because that is going to cause a run for the doors. That's what when people get their money out. And that's the institutional players, in a way, are already doing that with Deutsche Bank. They are withdrawing funds and questioning their liquidity. And then Deutsche Bank has emitted assets that are stored by other banks who are holding that as collateral so i mean it's been named i think it was by the imf as the the bank with the biggest risk of con uh, contagion of all the banks in europe um so we could have a lot a lot of fallout similar to 2008 uh, maybe worse and what is likely to happen is they're going to paper it all over they're just going to print money and try to do 2009 2010 again to just kind of you know drown everything in in, in new money but the debt has already increased. The world debt is now over a hundred trillion dollars. That is, um, that's already fifty percent more than in two thousand seven. So what's going to happen with the next crisis? They're going to like double the debt or triple the debt. Um, so I don't know. So I know your question is about specifics. Um, I I, re I always thought it would last longer than many people thought, but it was hard because when I when I got involved in two thousand eight, there was already a crisis. So a lot of people with great urgency were talking. There was this economist who was living in Mexico and he said, in hindsight, he said like, you know, the way it went in Mexico in the 80s was it got worse every day, just a little bit worse, just a little bit worse. And then one day it was all over. There was a 50% devaluation. Everything was in disarray. There's just one day. And uh, I think it's possible that we will see this, for example, in Japan, like things can just happen in one day where there's a big devaluation and, and then there's panic and the banks close and, you know, so so it's hard. It's hard. Uh, it's really hard to to. But I think in ten years from now, things will look extremely different from today, uh, and I think we will see a, a government bond market crash somewhere in the next five to seven years. Uh, and I'm talking government bonds of some like major established Western world countries. You mean as they will default and or they won't be able to issue new bonds, there will be no buyers. 
yeah, like the way it happened in Argentina was that uh, back in 2000, 2001 is that the local governments defaulted on their debt and those bonds were held by the banks. And so people realized that the banks were actually, you know, had worthless assets on their balance sheet. And so they went to the bank to pull out their money because they didn't trust it anymore. Uh, and so I think you've, uh, and also in the, the USSR, the end there was, you know, local uh, local debt that was basically going belly up. And so, for example, with Brexit in Europe, as things kind of kind of start falling apart, um, people don't trust that, uh, you know, Uncle Uncle ECB is going to rescue us. And that's when they sell the bonds and you get the bond crashes. So I think it's likely that it's probably going to be more on the local level first, maybe like Detroit or Puerto Rico or places like that. And then the contagion just just spreads to to larger, um, you know, larger government entities. Well, we're running uh, pretty late already, so but this was uh, extremely interesting to talk with you. It was a pleasure. I think it will be interesting, especially to kind of come back to this when we see some movement in this direction, oh, right? Yeah. When if you're going to see maybe something also in the economy changing, uh, and then if you, especially if we're going to see effects in on Bitcoin coming through that. I mean, really, when I got the interest in Bitcoin originally, I was also you know very very closely following the financial crisis in two thousand eight. And that was a big driver for me to to sort of just understand this alternative asset. And a little bit on the back of my mind, this whole time I've been thinking like, when is it coming? Because at some point it is. Uh, and uh, well, we're still waiting, but it will be. Yeah. And I think like, I mean, the three of us, I think it's fair to say like we're millennials. So the chance is very low that we have ever owned any blue chip stocks, for example, or like real estate of any significance. So in a way, we're very much not invested in the old financial system. We just kind of maybe have our degree and, you know, we have some knowledge about coding or some, you know, some, some, some practical things that help us make money. But um, so I think in that sense, we, it's easier for us to access the, the kind of outside perspective on what's really going on, especially after 2008. I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I also agree that uh, I also agree with you that there's, you know, there's a good chance that this this will happen again. And not much has changed since 2008 in terms of, uh, you know, regulation. And if, if anything, uh, uh, things perhaps are getting worse from uh, some viewpoints. And uh, now with uh, uh, now we can see similar things happening with that happened with subprimes with uh, 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 car debt uh, in the U.S. Uh, we see similar schemes and sort of reinsurance, uh, and um, and so I, I think that uh, on the one hand uh, there is a risk for this to happen again. On the other hand, I also think that uh, in some sense um, a lot of what what was the cause of the financial crisis in two thousand eight, or at least one of the major factors, was lost track of risk, and this is where blockchain technologies and I'm speaking more about, you know, sort of the permission side uh, can provide some mitigation for that, but that is going to take a long time to put into place and, you know, become, you know, commonly accepted and sort of a standard within financial industries, insurance, etc. Yeah, and I think crises could be a catalyst for this. Like, in a way, 2008 was already a catalyst, but if there's a new crisis, people are going to want more transparency and not just like you and me and any any consumer, but also on the corporate level, if you want to work together with another company, after there's been a major stock market crash, maybe you want some reassurance. Maybe you do want to see things that are um, publicly accessible on a blockchain about that other company. Uh, so I, uh, I think that, you know, that's just, just a thought that I really think that crises can be catalysts for good things too. So before we wrap up, do uh, you want to tell us about um, uh, Adamant Research and this podcast that you recently launched? Sure, yeah. So Adamant Research is the name for uh, my research activities. Um, I put out a, a report on uh, how to position for the rally in Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is actually worth 50% more since I put that out. Um, so so that's the rally I'm talking about. Um then uh, I, I am working on uh, new reports. Uh, for now, there is no subscription-based newsletter that is in, in the works for the long term. Um, and yeah, I did start with a podcast. I interviewed uh, Paul Stortz from uh, Bitcoin Hivemind, who's working on, on a, a very interesting sidechain project. 
Um, so yeah, the most of my activities are on Twitter. That's kind of where I announce what I do and um, the articles I wrote. I have a new article that just came out, uh, a two-part article. It's it's called "Why I'm Short Ethereum and Long Bitcoin," which kind of makes the case why I'm, I'm bearish on on Ethereum. So if you want to check that out, that's that's on Medium. Uh, and I think all those things are going to appear in, in the notes of this uh, of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tur, thanks so much for coming on. It was a pleasure talking to you again. And uh, very interesting to hear your, kind of your perspectives. And uh, hopefully we'll can, we can revisit these topics at some point in the future. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, let's revisit, uh, especially as soon as we see some big changes in, in the world economy. Absolutely. Okay, thanks so much, Tur. So also, thanks to our listeners. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And of course, we put out new episodes every Monday. Uh, and you can subscribe to it on your favorite podcast app or watch videos also on youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. So thanks so much and we look forward to seeing you back next week.